Hello and welcome to Field Fisher's Get Data Protection Fit series. My name is Lorna Cropper and I'm a director in Field Fisher's Data and Privacy team. Today I have the privilege of being joined by colleagues Matt Gregson, who is an associate in our team, and Tessa Waite, a solicitor in the team. As our regular listeners will be aware, but for anyone new joining, this is our third series of Get Data Protection Fit, which is a collection of bite-sized data protection training aimed at lawyers, privacy professionals, and anyone wanting or needing to understand the principles of data protection and the latest regulatory development. So that could include designers and project managers. And given how ubiquitous data protection is today, it's good that everyone has a level of understanding of the subject. We are presently recording a mini series of five episodes on data transfers. It's a particularly hot topic, keeping everyone in data protection particularly busy. Today, our focus is on transfer impact assessments, and in the last couple of months, we have recorded sessions on the EU SCCs, as well as the UK International Data Transfer Agreement. Those listening to this episode contemporaneously will no doubt be aware that the UK government published its Data Protection and Digital Information Number 2 Bill on the 8th of March 2023. It will be interesting to see what progress has been made by May in its journey via Parliament. We may also need to add an additional episode on the EU-US data protection framework as both continents endeavour to finalise a solution that will be robust enough to withstand any legal challenge. So the learning outcomes of today's bite-sized session are that you should be able to understand what supplementary measures the EDPB, that's the European Data Protection Board, recommend, including a TIA. When you'll need to use a TIA, the steps for completing a TIA, how to maintain and update your TIAs, and the UK's approach to restricted transfers. So by way of introduction and to provide some context for TIAs, you'll remember that the CJEU decision 311.18, aka SHREMS 2, held that the standard contractual clauses remain valid. However, transfers of data outside the EEA and the UK must provide a level of protection that is essentially equivalent to that provided in the EU UK. It's therefore imperative for data exporters, whether you're a controller or processor, on a case by case basis and in collaboration with the importer as necessary to evaluate the law of the country and take action if that law compromises the level of data protection. The court requested that exporters use supplemental measures to bring the standard of protection up to the level required by the EU if it wasn't already on a par or essentially equivalent. The EDPB has adopted a series of recommendations. Here is a screenshot of that first page and also this has a series of six steps to assist exporters in determining the level of protection that the country provides where you are transferring data to. I'll now hand over to Tessa, who will begin to examine the six steps individually. Thanks, Lorna. So when it comes to conducting TIAs, the EDPB recommendations suggest a detailed methodology. However, this can be broken down into six steps, with steps three and four being the most difficult. With this in mind, Field Fisher has created a TIA template which data exporters can use to complete their TIAs, and this is designed to address steps one to five of the requirements outlined under the EDPB recommendations. 
Now let's go through each of these steps in turn. Looking at step one, here it's all about knowing your transfers and documenting these in your TIA accordingly. You need to know where your transfers are going and this can be done by mapping all transfers of personal data outside of the EEA. Presumably, much of this step has already been completed before starting your TIA after undertaking data mapping for your ROPERS. It's important to note that a transfer under the GDPR does not have the literal meaning of only data moving from the EEA to a country outside of the EEA. A transfer also refers to access, so what this means is that access from a third country, for example China, to data in an EEA country also constitutes a transfer. Moving on to step two, this is about verifying the transfer tools on which your transfers will rely. Under the GDPR, there is a general prohibition against transfers of personal data out of the EEA unless the personal data is either transferred to a country considered adequate by the European Commission, such as the UK or Canada, or subject to one of the appropriate safeguards, such as binding corporate rules or standard contractual clauses, or if it benefits from a derogation for specific circumstances, such as the transfer being necessary on public interest grounds, but this is rarely used in practice. Where a country is not considered adequate, then the most commonly used transfer tools are BCRs and SCCs. For more information on these, see our next Get Fit session in April on BCRs and our earlier session from January on SCCs. Next is step three. This is one of the most difficult steps where you need to assess the recipient country's laws and practices that may impinge on the effectiveness of the transfer tools. To do this, the EDPB recommendations suggest that the data exporter should first consider the specific characteristics of each transfer, for example, the purpose and categories of data, as this will inform the nature of the risk and the local laws that are likely to apply. Against this context, the exporter should then consider, one, whether the applicable laws are likely to require the disclosure of transferred data to, or permit access of data by public authorities, such as for law enforcement, regulatory supervision, or national security purposes. And two, whether these requirements or powers are limited to what is necessary and proportionate in a democratic society. And by way of example, here you can see a snippet of the country assessment in our TIA for Vietnam. Due to the complexity of the third country assessment, Field Fisher's TIA templates are organized by country, where each includes a completed assessment undertaken by local council in that specific jurisdiction. For a data exporter completing this assessment themselves, they can complete this internally or by going out to local council, which will most likely be done via your external council as done here. It's important to note when conducting local country assessments that the key focus of this section is to assess the risk of public authorities accessing personal data that has been transferred from the EEA to the specific third country. This involves looking at the local regulations and procedures in place, or lack thereof, that empower public authorities to access data, any legislative restrictions to limit this access, and what can be done if authorities access data unlawfully. Now, one of the main pitfalls of completing the assessment can be that many inaccurately view it only from a data protection lens and provide just an overview of local data protection legislation. But in fact, what is often required is to look into public constitutional telecommunications and criminal law. Examples of questions that you may need to consider are, does the country's telecommunications law or criminal code 
allow public authorities surveillance powers to intercept communications or compel telecommunications companies to hand over data? And if so, are there checks and balances in place to ensure this access is limited to what is necessary and proportionate? Or are the authorities afforded discretionary powers to do bulk surveillance? Undertaking this sort of assessment of the laws and risks of a recipient country is not an easy task. However, the EDPB recommendations make it clear that it should not be skipped. I'll hand over to Matt to discuss steps four and five. Moving on to step four. If step three concludes that the laws and practices of the recipient countries do impinge on the effectiveness of your transfer tools, then you must identify supplementary measures that can bring the level of protection up to the standard required. The relevance of these measures to your transfers should be considered, adopted and then recorded in your transfer impact assessment. The EDPB recommendations at Annex 2 include a non-exhaustive list of example supplementary measures. These measures are grouped under the headings of technical, contractual and organisational measures. Whilst all of these measures should be considered and recorded in your assessment, you should also record whether importers require access to data in the clear, or whether robust technical controls such as encryption or pseudonymization measures can be implemented. This is quite a challenging area. The EDPB guidance suggests that in order to sufficiently protect transfer data, the importer should not be able to decrypt it or re-identify individuals within a pseudonymized data set. If properly implemented, this means your importer cannot share identified or identifiable data with authorities in third countries. This is because they do not have the means to render the data identifiable. Your assessment should also capture contractual and organisational controls which have been imposed on the importer. These can be used to complement the level of protection afforded by your technical measures. Again, these are included at Annex 2 of the EDPB recommendations. To draw out a few examples, these can include placing contractual obligations on your importer, for example, requiring them to provide or publish information relating to the frequency and type of access requests received from public authorities. And on the organisational side, scrutinising the data handling processes of your importer to ensure sufficient policies and procedures are in place. I will now hand you back to Tessa, who will talk about step six, re-evaluation. Thanks, Matt. Now we finally have step six, which is all about re-evaluating the level of protection required at appropriate intervals. To help with this, data exporters can maintain their TIAs by knowing their transfers. Then you will know if transfer details have changed and the TIA needs to be updated. Field Fisher maintains its TIA templates by seeking local council advice every six months to confirm if updates are required to the local country assessment. We also advise exporters to revisit their step three, preferably no later than a year since the last review to ensure that local laws have not changed. Now Lorna will take you through some key takeaways on TIAs. Well, thank you, Tessa and Matt, for running through those six steps. A couple of other takeaways with respect to your consideration of supplemental measures. It is not one TIA per jurisdiction. Depending on the data being transferred, the categories of data and the purposes for which it is being processed, you may need to do more than one TIA for a particular country. For example, if you're sending HR data and global customer advertising and marketing data to India, say, you will need to consider those transfers separately and ensure your documentation addresses the different requirements for the data being transferred. No doubt your HR data will include special category data, so may well need added protection. It's important to document the steps and the recommendations numerously refer to overall accountability. And in fact, a data protection authority can re 
request to see your documentation at any time with respect to your TIAs. So do have your documentation ready just in case. Also, what is the likelihood that the data you're transferring will be exposed to a particular regime in a certain country? If it's highly unlikely that that will not be the case, also ensure that it is documented. In the worst case scenario, it may be that you have to suspend the data transfer if you cannot offer essential equivalent protection to the data. As mentioned previously, Field Fisher has created a number of templates which include local country assessments. In fact, we have a portfolio of over 70 countries and counting, including key importer countries such as the USA, China, Australia and India. We are currently developing an online automated TIA process that will launch later this year in partnership with our alternative legal services business Condor. If you're interested in knowing more about our automation services, then please do reach out to us. Now I will hand over to Matt to discuss the UK approach. Thanks, Tessa. This episode would not be complete without also considering the ICO's welcome transfer risk assessment guidance and the accompanying transfer risk assessment TRA tool. Before looking more closely at the UK tool, it is important to highlight a couple of points. The tool is only intended to apply to routine restricted transfers. It should not be used for complex transfers, i.e. those where the data importers are in more than one country, and it should not be used for high risk processing activities, for example, activities where a DPIA would be required. The tool is also only sufficient for the purposes of UK GDPR. So if you think the EU GDPR is applicable, at least in part to your transfers, then it makes sense to follow the EDPB guidelines and use a TIA approach. That being said, transfer impact assessments are suitable for use in the UK. This means you don't have to complete a transfer impact assessment and the UK transfer risk assessment for the same transfer. So how does the transfer risk assessment work? We've included a breakdown of the transfer risk assessment tool in the slides. To summarize these considerations, the ICO approach focuses on whether the specific transfer increases the risk to people's privacy and other rights compared to the risk if the personal data remained in the UK. If there is no significant additional risk, the transfer may go ahead. Given that the importer will be bound to comply with the data protection rights under the Article 46 transfer mechanism, step two of the EDPB method, the TRA tool focuses mainly on the more general risks to human rights in the destination country. This is a big difference. Taking a look in a little more detail, two broad types of risks are considered. The first, risks arising from access by third parties, in particular governments and public bodies, and risks arising from difficulties in enforcing the Article 46 transfer mechanism. In light of this, the TRA approach proposed by the ICO is designed to be more pragmatic, risk-based and business-friendly than the approach advocated for by the EDPB in its guidance. The TRA will be a useful tool for UK-centric businesses especially those whose data flows are both straightforward and do not involve EU personal data. Beyond this, the TRA's role is likely to be limited. In many cases, we expect most organisations will continue following the EDPB's TIA approach, given the applicability of EU GDPR to their personal data transfers. I'll now hand you back to Lorna. Thanks again, Tessa and Matt, for your contributions today. So that's us with respect to TIAs and the UK's offering. But before we go, I'll just say a few words about Field Fisher's content on YouTube and online. You can subscribe to the YouTube channel. And overall, the channel hosts fundamentals about data protection law. There's also intermediate bite-sized sessions. We have 
subscriber Q&As with responses to those subscriber questions. And you'll also find a series of individual webinars which have been put together by the Field Fisher Data and Privacy team. Finally, here are our contact details should you wish to get in touch and discuss anything featured in today's session or in general about data protection. Thank you very much for joining us. We are very appreciative of you listening to these sessions and gaining a wider understanding about data protection. Thank you.